Oh, I'd like to see it go under 27 this year. When you say this year, so it is still a focus, even though like you can't qualify for the Olympics in the 50. Yeah, obviously the, the 100 is where you want to see the time drops. Matt always says something which I think is very true. It's very easy to make a swimmer fitter, but it's much, much harder to make a swimmer faster. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and back with me, as always, is my trusty co-host, Dan. And on this week's show, a little bit of deja vu, we're speaking Scottish breaststroke again, just after speaking to Ross Murdoch a few weeks ago, but this time we are speaking to Archie Goodburn. Yeah, Archie has been slowly working his way through the ranks with a big highlight of him hitting the 50 brush at Scottish record last season, which of course was brought up last week or a couple of weeks ago when Ross Murdoch came on. So let's find out what he thought of his exploits last season and what he aims to do for the rest of this very important season heading into the Paris Olympics. Yes, a swimmer I've certainly circled for 2024 and one I'm excited to see how he progresses into the Olympic year. So please welcome on to this week's podcast, Archie Goodburn. Archie, welcome. You're a swimmer with a Thank little you. bit of momentum behind you right now, thanks to LEN under 23s at the end of the or the back end of last year. So, how's your start to the season gone so far? I think it's gone it's gone as good as I could have hoped for, to be honest with you. Um, I've had a couple of new swimmers into the program um, just two a few weeks back from an altitude camp um, in Andorra, which I think is a pretty unexplored. Um, uh, location to go for the altitude camp, but we uh, had a good camp there with 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 Matt and the rest of the team. Um, it's my second camp with Edinburgh, and yeah, things are looking good. Going into some box racing this weekend, and then uh, uh, under uh, Euros in in December. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Nice. We'll we'll definitely touch upon that Andorra camp, but to start with, we said Elian under twenty one under twenty threes gave you some momentum. So what was your experience of it as a meet? Was it like a really good idea for swimmers like yourself? I think the idea behind it, yeah, is fantastic. Um, and it's something that like I almost could have done with earlier. I think that, that, like, that was my last, my last kind of year of it. Um, and if it's to be something that I would have brought in earlier, I think it would have been a much like really beneficial for me coming out the back of juniors and stuff. And I said that to a few people in a couple of interviews afterwards. Um, mm. I think it was hosted really well. Um, but as a meet for me, like, Matt, Matt was telling me like, oh no, you got to be happy with this. But I was slightly frustrated and annoyed with my performances. But um, there's a lot, there's a few things that came down to. And I think, although you said building momentum, it was it was a great experience, but it wasn't the step forward in times I was looking for. But um, I do certainly agree. Like, I think I've got some momentum behind me at the moment. I had I had a great season overall last year, short course and trials. So, um, what, what, but yes. Yeah. What do you think was missing from that LEN under 23's performance from yourself then? Uh, well, I was just really like to move it forward. You know, the tar- the like personal, personal best wise. Um, I was happy to come away with a medal. Like on paper, coming away with a medal was 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 a good result for someone on that team. But um, yeah, I just would have liked to have gone there and got some personal bests. But Matt and I tried a few other things out. I'm sure we'll come on to it. But like, I think after trials last last year, I kind of sat down with Matt and I said, like, Matt, there's a few things I want to um, kind of mess around with and just know deep down in myself that like I've, I've tried out all these different things we played around a lot with skin folds like that's something that I think is mm. really important and like maybe not so much skin folds as opposed to like where you hold the mass in your body like I'm really like prone to just putting on mass in legs and stuff um and I think yeah if you don't mind me, if you don't mind me diving down that um no no I go for it go for it I think like I've learned a lot about that through through injury and stuff so um, for example, throughout winter, like uh, last season, so after short course and the altitude camp we went on in January to Sierra Nevada, I was I was out out like legs and gro- groin, shin, just nonstop, like things clearing up. So I really not took a step back from. No, not good for a breaststroker. But then we learned stuff from it. Like these, those muscle groups weren't working as much as they would have normally done, I was doing meters and meters of pool and my skin, my like girth of my legs went down and everything. And like the way I sat in the water changed, there was a, this tilt. And I think at trials last year was the best I've ever felt in the water. And one of those factors could have been that change in their body mm. composition, which is quite interesting. Um, mm. Yeah. If that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> so how, so when it comes to gym work, are you doing less stuff on legs, like less squats because of this, let's say body balance issue let's say 
I think, I d- yeah, I don't know if it's a body balance issue or if it's just like some something that we hadn't picked up on. I think squatting okay. for a long time has been like something in the gym that I really liked. And it's just like mm-hmm. something that I've kind of like carried away, got carried away with it because it's an exercise <laughs> that I like. Um, but, you know, Dave, uh, he's our S&C uh, coach. Like they work really closely with Matt and stuff. And there's a lot of chat going on between them and really individualized programs and stuff. So Dave's been able to kind of sort that out for me and doing a lot less volume on the legs and then just focusing pure power. Um, and working a bit of upper body strength at the moment. So how yeah. beneficial is it like for your self-confidence heading into an Olympic year that the experimentation of 22-23 has kind of found this and you're you're heading into what is a big Olympic year knowing yeah. that maybe that sort of experimentation doesn't need to happen anymore. You you can be comfortable yeah. with what's what the output is. Yeah, no, exactly. Like um, like that's kind of the, what, what the goal was of that kind of post trials area there was things that Matt experimented with in training with volumes and intensities um we actually did a slightly different taper going into under 23s just so that swimming's there's so much of it it's just about belief as well so just knowing that we've explored those avenues going into like this trial cycle and these other cycles and that taper to come and the gym programs to come like knowing that we've narrowed down and explored other avenues, but narrowed down to the avenue that we think is the most beneficial for me. Do you reckon it's good that you have a coach that is uh, open to experimenting in all sorts of different ways? I, I imagine Big some time. people are quite some people are quite happy sticking to one sort of way of training, you know, kind of meters, let's say, or sprinting, whatever it is. But yeah. you've got Matt who's open to doing almost anything at the moment. Are you, yeah. are you happy with that? That's the, 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 the sort of training you like? Yeah, I think honestly, I think Matt's. Uh, I think Matt's a great coach. Sometimes I think he said on the podcast that he's with you guys that he, he paints a picture in his head that he sometimes doesn't quite write down in the pool. So, so you know, you can rock up to training and Matt's got a, just like a little technique idea that he wants to try out. And most of the time, like these are things that we then use on and on in training, and I think they're really, really good. Um, but yeah, it means a lot to me that I've got a coach that's willing to try things and like. Mm. Maybe sometimes he 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 deep down knows that trying this isn't the best thing, but he wants to like watch me learn. And if he thinks it's not going to be too um, un, not unbeneficial, what's the word? Too detrimental to my swimming. Like he'll he'll let me make that mistake in a way, and like let me let me try that because there's no better way to learn a lesson than like make the mistakes yourself. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the time, like you have conversations around this this coach swimmer relationship, and a lot of it is about the buy in from the swimmer. Like the swimmer's got to buy in and trust the coach. Yeah. But actually, what you're saying is there's a coach buy in as well. Like the way Matt trusts you to make oh, your yeah, mistakes. Yeah. You know, the, there's that mutual relationship that maybe sometimes gets forgotten. Yeah. Well, I think if I turned out to train, I was like Matt. Let's try no mirrors. <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's just sit on poolside and visualize. I don't think that. I don't think. I don't think he'd let me try that one out. But um, yeah, no, you're certainly right. I think it's important that there's there's that relationship in the other direction as well. I think it kind of like snowballs back and forth when 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 you get it right. Um, and yeah, I, I really like my relationship with Matt. Like, if it's on a level where we can you know, like bounce ideas off each other, sometimes disagree, maybe fall out. But like, it's, it's like some of, <laughs> we can like, you know, we can sort that out and like in a day's time, we'll be fine again um, yeah. and stronger from it kind of thing. So, yeah. Well, while we're on the topic of training then, uh, you just said you've just come off the back of Altitude at Al- Andorra. Yeah. So what was that like? Like, let's start with not the swimming side, the experience side. Yeah. Because I know I mean, Andorra like Andorra. is a gorgeous place. Yeah let's, yeah, let's go down that route first. Yeah, so am I like I've not visited all the all the so-called altitude uh, sites um, in my time. You know, Andorra was only my second camp. I did get to go to Sierra Nevada with um, Edinburgh in January, which was a great experience in itself. Um, uh, but kudos to Matt. Like, I know there are a few people that have been to Andorra. Kudos to like the rest of Edinburgh Uni guys for sorting that out. You know, not all the swimmers in our top squad are. Are, are are like benefit benefited by some kind of funding. You know, I'm lucky enough to be supported by Scott Swimming, get a scholarship through the uni, which is great, and like I'm so grateful for. Um, but we can't really afford to go to Flagstaff or something like that. Like not all our swimmers. So like the fact that Matt was able to still like secure us this high altitude facility with everything we needed there, um, for a fraction of the cost uh, was just was just fantastic. But 
And uh, yeah, it was it was beautiful. The the drive there from the airport was 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 insane as well. Um, it's kind of always it is it is similar to Sierra Nevada in the way that like these places are shut down. Like we're there when they're not meant to be people there. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the, these are these are like winter places. Um, so we're going back there in January. So mm-hmm. I'm sure I'll see a much different place. But honestly, it was weird because Andorra sits right on the border of France, so it's like a tax yeah. haven in a way. So people are just run up and down the mountain to get like, it's like a Costco village. If you search up, if you search up Pasta de Casa or something on uh, on Google, you get, it doesn't say like town in Andorra. It's, it's, it's a shopping center in Andorra. Like it's just huge supermarkets full of like bulk buys, like alcohol and cigarettes. Um, <laughs> so I'm like on the Sunday, people just come up from France and just fill their car with this stuff. Um, so that was interesting to see. Um, and also it was a bit of an experience for us trying to find fresh food because all this was just like long-term storage stuff. So we would trek down the mountain uh-huh. while well, we were staying like slightly further up the mountain in this Airbnb, not Air, I don't know if they found it on Airbnb. I think it was booking.com, but um, in these wee like self-service apartments. So we were cooking for ourselves, which was quite a good fun um, in these little like two and three bed apartments. So we'd walk down and we just went to this little place called the Carrefour every day for our, for our corn fried chicken breasts. I've never had corn fried chicken <laughs> breasts. Um, um, but yeah, that was like the only place we could get fresh meat. But at least we found it. Yeah. It sounds like you had a pretty good time when you weren't out in the pool. But when you were in the pool, was it a bit more of a, a challenging sort of week or however long you went? Is it like How long did you go for actually? Was it three weeks uh, in the end? Three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Three weeks, yeah. How, how was the training? Um, yeah, pretty pretty, pretty hard work. Um, mm. It always is a bit of a kick up the backside when you get up there. But um so the sessions were hard, but the, the swimming pool there is actually beautiful as well. I need to mention that the insane view. You just like look off the mountain. I thought Sierra Nevada was good. Um, but yeah, lots of training, lots of lactic tolerance stuff. Um, lots of pretty chilled out meters as well. But um, yeah, there was um, quite a lot of hard lactic tolerance and stuff. But, so what, what's yeah. the effects and benefits of altitude? The effects and benefits of altitude, right. So I think... Well, when, when we're going up to altitude, you're looking for an increase in your hemoglobin mass in your blood. Um, how much you get can depend. Well, firstly, it depends on what you if you're doing the right stuff when you're up there. But also, you have uh, there's very individual responses. Um, Matt's been Matt's been taking the Edinburgh program for quite some time now, and he usually gets very good responses. I think our squad average was about five percent hemoglobin mass increase, which is anything over two percent is like seen as a substantial increase. So. For Matt's average, the squad, I think of, I think it was like twelve or fourteen summers of us all to be in that zone is pretty, pretty great job. Um, we got some pretty mega responders. Um, my girlfriend Kira Sloshin, she, uh, she came back with a ten percent um, hemoglobin oh. increase, which is phenomenal. Like you can imagine having ten percent more ability to carry oxygen in your blood. Like what, what difference that's going to make when you come back? So, mm. yeah, effectively more hemoglobin, higher VO two max is a really strong correlation between that. Um, and that's kind of the benefit you're hoping for when you come back, carry more blood around, uh, more oxygen. And what kind of effect does it have on your body? So when you're up in the mountains and you're training, doing those lactose tolerance sets, what does it kind of feel like is happening to you while you're doing it? Oh, just breathless, I would say. Like, just run out of breath a bit quicker. I don't know how noticeable it is for me. Well, me doing my pullouts is very noticeable. So hypoxic work as well, like slow breaststroke hypoxic work, that's pretty brutal as well. Um mm physiologically like your heart rate just sits so much higher and your and your calorie intake needs to go up like i i lost a few kilo few kilos going there my goal was to lose a lose a couple kilos to kind of sit back in that body composition range that we defined last year so it's like 49 skin folds i'm still trying to do a bit of work to put a small bit more mass up upper body and try and keep the legs in the same area but the goal was to lose a bit of body fat when i went up there and get back into that skin fold range that we've we've found for me um yeah, so calorie calorie intake has to go up, and your heart rate just sits higher. My HRV was was all over the place. <laughs> yeah. How do you test for those levels? Like, okay, you're, you're you're saying hemoglobin and yeah, oxygen, but how are I don't know the sports science guys? Yeah, actually measuring that on you? Can't give you the exact equations. <laughs> but, um, like, are they taking blood? Is that the sort of thing? Yeah, that's happening? yeah. So we go in, get uh, bloods taken from your finger just little prim pricking into these little uh, tubes. Uh, and then 
and then you're effectively breathing into like a balloon for for two mm-hmm. minutes so you such i think the the goal is you're saturating your hemoglobin like you you're breathing co2 producing like mm-hmm. producing some carbon monoxide like and you produce less carbon monoxide um the more hemoglobin you have so that way that vial that they take away they can test for like carbon monoxide measures uh and then they can directly measure your blood i think for hemoglobin i don't know if it's indirect measurement or direct but and is there any point when you're at altitude that there's it's like dangerous for you is there any point where you could be told to go home because it's not working for you i don't think we're going to those levels where you'd be told to go home um there's certainly so we're up there we were lucky enough to be able to fly mike our physiologist out this time um, and he was there for the first half of the camp and he'll come for the first half of the next camp as well. So the first week and a half. And he's, so you're most sensitive in the first couple of days. Um, and he keeps an eye on our HRVs, our, our body weights and our hydration. And, you know, we're only going to like a high ski resort. It's not like you're at Everest base camp or anything. Like no one's, no one's, no one's, no one's going to be dying. But like, um, if you wake up and you're starting to show like excessive signs of fatigue on your HRV or your hydration is bad, like you might get, you to take the afternoon off and just focus on recovery and get back in the right place but yeah so when, when you come back from altitude then how much better do you feel do you feel like you've you're so much fresher you've got so much more energy and stuff like that or is, well, it, actually, is it the opposite because i've spoken yeah it depends like, again offline to a few swimmers who were racing like the week off flagstaff the altitude yeah. camp that a lot of those did and they felt horrible racing yeah some some people love it some people do train some people do like actively race straight off the back of um altitude i absolutely tanked like <laughs> the week <laughs> the week when we came back i was so bad um two of our swimmers david and uh, stephen clegg david cumberlich and stephen clegg um went away to uh the norway, north sea meet norway yeah, yeah. Mm. They, they both swam brilliantly, like great season opener swims for them. So I was busy sat at home looking at the results thinking, how are they doing that? <laughs> because I was, <laughs> I was in on my deathbed that weekend. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it just depends how aggressive your adaptation is, I suppose. And yeah. I think generally girls and boys get it differently. Mike was telling us, physiologist Mike, um, was telling us that um, boys tend to get it in the first week and girls sometimes in the second week. But some people just come back and feel fresh from it and just have a great time. But, yeah, I think um, Matt was saying like Cara was off the charts when she's got back down from altitude before. Yeah, like, Cara like just mm. sucks up all the extra oxygen and she's away. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, like Cara goes into the tent, and she comes out of the tent, and she's like, Poosh. yeah, it's, it's cool to see. So yeah, oh, she's amazing. flying. I hope well. I hope that has helped everyone understand altitude training a little bit more who maybe might not get the chance to go experience it themselves um mm-hmm. if we kind of finalize kind of the training portion of this podcast yeah. is there any intensity shift right now knowing that this is an olympic trial year like is there a bit of tension around camp or is it still relaxed happy i think it's always there's always a bit of tension um but like I think Edinburgh's in a place where it's really growing, like it's really on the up. So the I know you guys mentioned like I've got feel, you feel like you've got I've got a bit of momentum around me, but I feel like Edinburgh's program's got even more momentum in it. Um, so I don't know how much of a shift of intensity there's had to be had to be if you know what I mean. Um, I think I think the program everyone already had their sights set on the next level last season. You know as we're all trying to like be on the come up, it's not like we're already all there and we're just trying to do our best to stay there. Um, it's like a continual continuation of what we've been doing. Um, I've actually not heard anyone use the word Olympic shift. Um, huh. Yeah. But um, we have, you know, we've obviously had team meetings and stuff and like being like guys, it's Olympic year, but um, um, I think we're all pretty good at doing the, the stuff you're supposed to do. And um, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if there's any extra pressure on you guys when you like you fill your headspace. You like, right? I've got to perform at trials. I've got to be absolutely set for trials, and then all going well. Then you know your your mind changes yeah. going towards Paris. I'd wonder if there's so there's nothing. It's all almost as, as normal right now. I think when you're when you're in the train, when you're in the pool, you're there. You're there to give it your best every every day anyway. But like, you're certainly right. Walking around daily life, I'm I'm kind of like, oh God. 
like do I have a chance of making this team like that and like what what would that what would that do to like my life and like how I how I perceive my swimming achievements mm-hmm. like like how would that make me look back on my career if I was to um, qualify for Olympic Games and yeah, that adds pressure yeah. <laughs> to be fair <laughs> yeah we, we might get into that a little bit at the end of this podcast but for yourself kind of racing starts in earnest now with um European short course yeah so you've earned selection for the December meet how much yeah. of a boost is that going to be heading into 2024 for you to go race over in Romania pretty pretty huge boost like I'm I'm, I'm like so like um honored to be like selected for that team i was really really happy to be selected for that team and go out there with cara um in december uh and i think one of my long-term goals is like since i started swimming was to represent gb at senior level so i can take that box off and like that's something i hope to do again um and it's, yeah it's definitely a boost it's it's great to have like an end of cycle target where you're going to get some really high quality racing um in, and i think that's important for me because I'd need a taper to swim well, so I'd love any opportunity to get a taper and hopefully perform. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a big yeah. experience British squad going. Uh, so what's the advantage yeah. of racing short course, especially like it's, it's Olympic season, so you know, it's long yeah. course is going to be the priority. But what is the benefits or advantages of racing short course right now? It's skills intensive, isn't it? Like if you can, if you can, especially breaststroke, where you like these huge like anaerobic kind of demands off every wall. Um, hypoxic demand, sorry, not anaerobic demand. Um, off every wall, like if you can put together four turns in just under a minute, like very, very well, it's going to be much easier to do it. Like one turn, uh, three turns, and then one turn in a long course pool. So I think it's just like intense, like focus on your skills, um, mm. and I think that has its huge benefits, like this, this huge time savings for everyone and skills. Um, Are you looking to like take advantage of? kind of the opportunity that you've got it given the absence of like adam and james who aren't racing short course at this meet they're they're purely yeah. focusing on long course this season um yep. you're looking to leave a mark on like the medley relays and put your hands up for selection yeah no, i'm definitely i would definitely open to like get on obviously it's only greg and i are the best strokers there that are going as you as you said so i'm definitely hoping to get some representation on the relays to be honest, if they were there, I'd be, there's a four by fifty. Like, if they were there, I'd be hoping to be like one of the top two swimmers to be like swimming maybe the heat, like for the four by mm-hmm. fifty. Even if those two bigger boys had been there, short course, I think I'm, I think I'm maybe a slightly better short course swimmer than I'm long course. And a uh, fifty was pretty good at short course last at Scott's short course last year. Um, so yeah, definitely looking to get get involved in those relays and see if I can start trying to fill those boots. <laughs> They're big boots. <laughs> Just yeah. A little bit. yeah. I suppose in terms of filling boots, uh, Scotland does have a bit of a history of, of the stroke of breaststroke. I mean, with the likes yeah. of Ross Murdoch, we spoke last to, spoke to last week, uh, Michael Jameson, Craig Benson. What's it like following in those kind of guys' footsteps? Yeah. Um, well, we'll just, throw it back a little bit to the com- to Commonwealth Games. Like, I think that was just a fantastic experience. Like, so I'd obviously moved down to Loughborough. I was down south um, after my junior career. And I never really, like, got to know those guys because I wasn't racing with them at the Scotch meets and stuff. Um, mm. Got to know Wilby a little bit more instead. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then uh, I kind of came to the Commie Games and, like, had never really spoken with them and, like, I just had a great time racing those boys, like learned a lot from Ross and Craig. Like they're just in, they're in, it was just an invaluable experience and really good fun. And like a nice way to kind of end their, their like how I, how I saw them like from being mm. idols in my head when I, when I started swimming to them just being like my teammates. And then obviously the after partying with them afterwards was just it was, <laughs> it was like full cycle for me. It was really, really cool. So it like yeah, a, a I'm, pinch I'm, me moment. Yeah, and I'm I'm like honoured to hopefully carry on the tradition, as Ross would say. I, what's it? He's like passing of the God. He puts it better than me. He says some very um, uh, passing like, the torch. Passing of the torch. That's it. You can yeah. tell he's been on the podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, he's a good. They're, they're both great lads. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's an honour for me to pass that on. And I squeezed out his fit. I, I, I pipped him on the 50 best joke and got a Scottish record last year as well, which was nice too. And he yeah, so we he was the first person to text up. me. We were yeah. going to bring yeah. that up. Is that, um, 
a bit of a target of yourself, like the Scottish records, are they circled for you? Of course, yeah, I think so. Some of Ross's are pretty exceptional. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, of course, I'm looking to try and um, get after them. But as I said, he was the first person to text me when we did the 50, when I did the 50 long course last year. Um, which I thought was just like it's just top class classic Ross yeah. Murdoch movie, isn't it? He, he is a um, top man. Yeah. How much so, lower do you reckon you can get that fifty then? Oh, I'd like to see you go under twenty seven this year. Ooh. When you say nice this year. year, so it this is season. still a focus, even though like you can't qualify for the Olympics in a fifty. So what's the benefits in focusing of trying to go sub twenty seven? Okay. To yeah. the hundred, like how does that actually benefit long term? Yeah, obviously the the hundred is where you want to see the time drops. Um, Matt always says something which I think is very true: it's very easy to make a swimmer fitter, but it's much much harder to make a swimmer faster. If that just, okay. if that kind of makes any sense with you, yeah. Um, yeah. Like if you can be mu- if you can be much faster, then you can go out easier, and it's very easy mm. to still come back at the same time. If that, yeah. But I am also at the same time trying to look to get better. I, I loved racing the 200 at trials last year. I can't, I'd never have the same experience on the 200 untapered. Um, but I'm looking to try and, you know, swim the 200 a, a bit faster in season and then faster when I'm rested as well, just as like a mentality thing. Like if I can swim a good 200, think how easy the 100 becomes in your head. Yeah, I suppose the best comparison would be um, the Chinese brusher Ching Haiyang because his his PB is like fifty seven point, but then if he turns on a minute point for his two hundred, that's PB plus three, which is actually for him, yeah. I imagine, is relatively comfortable. Whereas you look at Sax Topity Cook, yeah, PB like, is about doing just about fifty nine. Yeah. yeah, so then it, it would be yeah. easier for him to hit a minute than it would do for Zach, for example. So I I, I can see what Matt's trying to say there. It would be easier to be fitter than it is being faster. Sounds yeah. weird, but I think I think I know what you're trying to say. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and also like, um, there's there's such I, you know, Cam McAvoy's been talking about like low hanging fruit in technique, like small changes in technique mm-hmm. on every rep, like make a, a huge difference. Whereas you can just like destroy yourself for a week doing volume and like really hard sets, and then get like this much faster because you were like that much fitter. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly gains to be made in both both ways. It's just um yeah yeah so when you say you're looking for like the changes in technique and stuff like that what is what's highlighted to you that needs to be improved on Uh, okay um so for me i had a pretty like severe kind of like fall apart of my shoulder um in the commies here so my right shoulder has a has a calcification in it like on the tendon so at some point, like it just was getting battered, and it's the tendon like bled a little bit, and you get this calcification effect on it, um, and it just got inflamed and like so weak, um, rotation wise. So you just, we're on a podcast, and we got the video here. So like <laughs> this hand, just this this like rotation on this arm just wasn't equal to the other one. So under fatigue, okay. that even though the shoulder's much better now, under fatigue, that that kind of shows itself. Um, so a big thing is looking at my breaststroke technique under fatigue and make sure I'm keeping that symmetry. Um, because I was say, cause yeah. as soon as you're not symmetrical, then that's, you know, you're borderline DQ there. So that's one thing to be careful of. Yeah. I no no Marshall's going to spot that, but <laughs> they, need <to> have, <laughs> they need to be a banging Marshall to spot that. But, um, <laughs> it's more like once, once that goes, I'm just not getting as much lift out of the water and hip sink. And timing comes, mm. timing falls to bits, type thing. It yeah. sounds like a fairly serious, like long-standing injury. Is it? Yeah, that was a real blight on that commies season. I think it really. I think, unfortunately, I was ninth twice at commies in the fifty and the hundred, and I think there was there was there was probably there could have been more to come if I could have kept myself together in those races. Um, but like, happy to see the back of it and learn learned a lot about it um i mentioned earlier like injury has been a big thing for me since i came to edinburgh just a complete change of stimulus to what i was doing to loughborough i think had a bit quite an impact on my tendons and like i was just seeing inflammation everywhere and we've done a lot of work with like the a great physio network at edinburgh and scottish institute um to get that sorted out and 
I'm injury free since uh, probably trials last year, which is pretty phenomenal for me and something that we'd identified before trials, like something we wanted to really sort out because it was just like, we could never really execute the training box that Matt wanted to like, execute. So mm. we're in a when position now to do that. Sort it out. Is it like load management? Is it more pre pool? Is it physio? Is it, I don't know, surgery? Is it how, what do you mean by sort it out? Yeah, luckily I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't have to get surgery. The, the summer, the summer after commies was enough to just like, let the inflammation like flow out of it. That whole season was just like inflammation management. Um, mm. But, the way we saw it, like Edinburgh's got great equipment for kind of testing every tendon you can imagine on these like force machines and stuff. So the way we've just sorted it is measure, measuring that and then just general rebuild. Nothing was actually broken, if, you know, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and I can't pinpoint what exactly it was that fixed it, but there was various things that we tried in like pre-pool and shoulder exercises. And um, we, we used a sonification machine, which just like, bash you with like ultrasonic pressure waves not ultrasound ultrasound yeah pressure waves and I like, like to break out kidney stones yeah something <laughs> like that i don't know if that's what matt what's what matt liked to slag that one off he was like he was like that is he's like that's a load of nonsense there's no way that's fixing your shoulder <laughs> but um, we'll see yeah everyone was trying was trying lots of different things and yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm glad to sound, oh, glad to hear that it's all better now. So, yeah. what's what's the end goal of this year? Then we've spoken about like short course and how you want to swim yeah. fast, representing GB. But what's the targets for, or what's the targets you've written down for 2024? Um, I want to swim the Fina A time for the 100 breaststroke, the the power speed A time 59.49. Ahead of ahead of me are, are, is Greg Butler like, and and the, and two of the fastest um, breaststrokers of all time. You know, I think will I think I don't know if this was pre or post um, uh, Chin, but like will be in P or like number one and A of all time. Um, mm. So I'm just going to do everything I can swim the fastest race I can on the day, and uh, be in that be in that top two. I think it'd be foolish not to like if you're anywhere near if you're near if you're anywhere near. Why don't you just aim for it? You know. Um, yeah, it's the FINA A time, the the standard for British swimming these days. It's not, is it? It's we'll, well, we'll see, we'll see. That's what we put on paper. Um, well, I think Matt's actually put down slightly faster than that. <laughs> um, oh, you, you got to aim nine. big. Yeah, yeah Matt has put down big. a slightly faster time than that. But um, yeah. have you got yeah. a a race strategy going into uh, trials or you know Edinburgh International, or whatever? Um. I don't, I've not so much got a race strategy. I've got a season plan in terms of my um, breaststroke, my hundred breaststroke. It's, it's improving in season times. So right. something something that I feel is a big weakness of mine is the ability that my or my or so called my lack of ability to swim my pit, my near my personal bests in season. That's something that Kara's insane at. Kara like mm. consistently swims pbs in season it's unbelievable to watch um whereas i'm busy floating around three seconds away from my pb <laughs> um and i think that kind of limits limits what i'm able to do when i'm when i am tapered because it's like a different experience isn't it like i've not got as much experience in in that race swimming those times as, as Kara is able to build up throughout the season and um she can she can play around with it because she, she's like constantly doing this time and really fine tune it whereas Mm. I'm getting as close as I can at the moment, but I'm not able to swim my PB and fine tune it like like she's maybe capable of. And I think that's one of her, her strengths. And kudos to her for because she's because she, she's brilliant at it. Um, mm. And it's something I've identified with Matt, and something I definitely did do better last year. You know, swimming like one on one mids in one on one mids um, in season. So I've never done that before, and it translated to pretty good trials. Um, mm. So yeah, we have a little term in the squad called Norbs. Which is um, a no rested best. So the the goal is to oh. achieve lots of norbs this season. Yeah. Weird terminology, but okay, we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a Matt that's a Matt thing, definitely, surely. <laughs> no, I made that up. I made that up. <laughs> oh, you made yeah. it up. Oh, Matt fine. cannot take that Matt cannot take credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> I like uh, it. Though. What do you is reckon it... Sorry. Go what there. do you reckon it'll take to uh, to put pressure on the top two guys at trials then? What do you think is gonna what what do you reckon you've got to do to be able to get on the team? What do I, what time? Yeah, what what, what yeah, time? What, 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 Maybe what not time even time. time. Maybe just how do you want to race it to put pressure on them? 
Mm. That's two different questions. Hang on. That's two different questions. Yeah. Hang on. We'll do do yours first and then we'll do time second. I think I think I honestly think second's gonna be just a a fifty nine pretty a pretty low fifty nine I think is gonna be second place. So that's what I think. Yeah. I think a fifty nine a low fifty nine is gonna be good enough, but then I think the the, the time they you've got to hit is gonna be around about that sort of time. Yeah. And there could be like three or four of you around that time. So then there's only gonna yeah. be two places. So you've got to finish top two, I imagine. I think the point I think you I think the point you I think the most important thing is finishing top two. I think the point you made about oh. um more more than two people going under the FINA time is, is possible to happen. Hmm. Like that's just the that's just the state it's in when you've got two best strokers like that at the top of the country. It's still 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 plodding along. Um, well, no, they're not plodding along; they're flying along. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> no one's plodding going sub sixty. Yeah, no. that's for sure. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be one hell of a race come trials mm. that 100 breaststroke. Um, and you say you're racing the two as well? Yeah, I have. I have a mix. Like I never raced the two. I never really raced the two hundred when I was younger. I think I very quickly decided that I wanted to be a 50 and a hundred breaststroker, but every, I keep trying 200. Sometimes it just, it's, it's just, it's embarrassing sometimes my 200, but um, sometimes I just get this, like, I just love the race, even though I'm not going any kind of phenomenal times. I just enjoy like actually racing and settling down in, into a race. Like it's not just over like that. Um, so I'm looking forward to racing it at box. Um, I spoke to Ian Wright, the head of Scottish Women. Um, um, recently, and he was he was asking me about some of the two hundred uh, euros. We've not actually done the entries for euros yet, or I've not been asked about entries for euros yet. Um, but I'd like to swim the two hundred there and give it a short tapered and short course because I've actually I don't I don't think I've ever done that in, in about five or six years. So, mm. but yeah, I don't know if I'll just get a chance to do that at the, at the Europeans representing Britain. But we'll see. Nice, nice. Um, well, actually, it's been a lot of fun talking. And before we finish, we have some quick fire questions. So no worries. let's go through those. So what's your favorite event? Oh, 100 breaststroke. Uh, who's your swimming idol? It's Ross and Craig. Ross, ben- yeah. Ross well, Benson. Ac- That's what we'll call it. Ross two. Benson. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your proudest moment in swimming so far? God, I sound like such a fanboy, guys. But um, so, I, I, I mean, becoming British champion was 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 pretty big for me at the, on the fifty last year. But like, the most exhilarating thing was qualifying for commies. I don't know if you guys saw that race when the three Scots did it all in the same heat. Do you remember that? Yeah. Did you see that? That was just fantastic. That was just unreal. Can't it's be Scottish thing. We spoke yeah. to Ross about this. It's just. Do you say the same thing? It, it hits you differently. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What's the hardest set you've ever done in training? Ooh. Oh. Matt's had us do 650s. Mm. Um, and that's probably like the most I've ever felt lactic in my life. 650s on like, uh, like five, six minutes, I think it was. Just like loads of lactic just pushing through it but aerobically and like mentally challenging sets some of the ones i did at the left national center i think i did i think i did 10 threes but i don't know if this is just a dream i think i did 10 threes best average <laughs> and i think i think i think that was like that was the set where i was just like questioning it the most i was like <laughs> yeah but have we don't tried, do anything you, like that in edinburgh so have you tried to suppress it so much that you now believe it's a dream and you just <laughs> yeah <laughs> ho- hope that didn't happen you don't have to do it again yeah or maybe yeah i don't know I don't know if it was like four, three hundred's best average, and then in my head I just like was like, "Oh my god, it's ten. <laughs> or you know, I like, made it so much worse than it is over time. Yeah. Like if you ask me the same question in five years' time, I'll be like, "Oh, I did fifteen threes max." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I did ten threes. But I'm pretty sure. Oh, lovely. Um, and final question: Guess though you're away from a swimming pool, if you just go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. You could take friends, family, celebrities. Who would you take with you? Oh, Neil Armstrong. Um, Elon Musk. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna go straight. So, yeah, Elon Musk and um, don't actually know his name, but the can't remember his name. But basically, the founder of this rocket company called Orbex. I'm very into aerospace and stuff like that. And this oh, is a company okay. that I love, and I've forgotten the name of the founder, the CEO. But yeah, mm. 
Uh, look, yeah. Archie, it's been so much fun talking to you. Before we finish, I do want to make sure you get a shout out for if everyone has been watching the Tash that's oh, on yeah. the screen. So, where can everyone <laughs> donate? Oh, we'll, um, we'll put a link where everyone can donate. But yes, why are you guys? Uh, if in you guys, doing I will it? give you guys the link for that. But um, Edinburgh Uni Performance Team are doing a Movember, and there's a couple of a couple of us doing it. And uh, I'd appreciate any support you can guys uh, can can give to that. And as I said, these guys will get the link, and hopefully they can put that out for, mm. for everyone to click on. Yeah, definitely. Two weeks in, it looks like it's just about turning up on your face now, looking through the screen here. <laughs> We're missing a bit in the middle. Yeah. The, cameras, the viewers are going to get some odd angles of me just looking at my moustache and the, <laughs> yeah. the camera now. But um, yeah, try my best. Try my best for the cause. Um, and yeah, definitely missing a bit in the middle, but hopefully by the end of the month that fills up. But yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Well, Archie, <laughs> best of luck racing out in Romania at the end of, well, middle of next month. It's not even the end. Yeah. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you on the full side very soon, I'm sure. Yes, I hope so. Right. Thank you for Thanks, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honour. So, cheers to that. Yeah, thank you for coming on, and we look to see you on poolside. Hopefully, Edinburgh International, if not before. That'll be the aim. That's the idea. Lovely. Might be Bucks okay. this weekend if you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Dan, straight off the back of speaking to Ross Murdoch, what, two weeks ago, it was really good to speak to another Scottish breaststroker and one coming through the ranks quite quickly, I feel, after. Well, he says a slightly disappointing end to last year, but the whole of last season felt like Archie really was on the rise. And especially, like, we've spoken to Matt Trodden before. He's got a brilliant coach in his corner. And if maybe there is someone who can break into the the three names who've been picked for British women recently over the past few years, I kind of feel like Archie's right up there in amongst it now. I feel like he's been building quite well actually yes he said he had a bit of a bad LEN under 23s he came away with silverware mind you I still think that's an you know, achievement medals, in itself it? yeah uh, he's, like you say he's got a very good coach in Matt Trodden the fact that he's able to experiment and Archie's receptive to that I think it, like he was saying on a podcast it goes both ways and he yeah. likes that idea I know some swimmers would probably like it in one way and it has to be staying that way the whole time Archie's open to doing that which is quite exciting and which is probably why you're seeing quite a bit of advancements and he's progressing quite well right now mm. I think he's one to look out for for the 100 pressure at come trials um, yeah I think he's on the right trajectory and he's got a bit of we talked about Scottish breaststroke a little bit <laughs> and they're he, trying to fill some boots and stuff like that you know so it's it's, it's interesting and he's honoured to be alongside those names that we mentioned earlier which is interesting as well yeah, I think as well beyond Olympic trials like in April time, the short course Europeans, I think he could actually make a little bit of a name for himself because he is a very strong short course swimmer. I've, yes. I've seen it at Scottish Winters last year mm. and there isn't an Adam, there isn't a James Wilby, there's no longer a Ross Murdoch. He's there as, I would say, the best sprint breaststroker on that squad, especially 50. Yeah. Um mm there's an open door to medal like european wise for him in that event well you said the the benefits of racing short course is to focus on the skills and the, the big skill especially on a, a 50 meter breaststroker or sprint breaststroker in general is the underwater phase the pullout phase which he's extremely good at so when it comes to a 50 or 100 he will use that and utilize that massively to the point where he might even end up on the podium you never know but he's definitely in terms of british points of view he would be the number one breaststroker going in for that particular event definitely 100%. Okay, so that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And me and Dan will be back in seven days' time. Thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.